thank you for coming. It's a great privilege to be back in London, and I hope that God will bless his word to you in the nights ahead, God willing. Um, just to clarify some things, the meetings are announced for an hour, but a preacher should never keep talking when he's done preaching. So if the topics finish before the announced hour, the meeting will end early. Uh, but if you are inviting anyone, you can assure them that the meetings will not go beyond the time that is announced. Would you turn please to the book of Romans, Paul's letter to the Romans, <clears throat> and we're going to read in chapter one. Romans chapter 1. It is interesting to me that to a people who gloried in power, the Romans, Paul should write about the power of God in resurrection and then the power of God that we'll read about in the gospel and then his power in creation. Notice verse 15. So as much as in me is... I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. <clears throat> so I sometimes think that this is the kind of gospel series that nobody's happy with. People who have done a deep search into these things will wonder, why is he being so superficial? And people who think that none of this should be discussed in a gospel meeting will be thinking, why is he so confusing? So nobody seems to like it, but I hope that it will at least be a help as we consider these important truths. The Bible's full of this kind of preaching. Luke said he examined these things carefully, and then when he wrote his book of Acts, he said that there were infallible proofs that he was bringing together in the book that he was writing. And you remember Paul uh, telling the Philippians to set themselves for the, the defense and the confirmation of the gospel, and uh, calling on Timothy to refute what is wrong and to defend the truth, and Jude calling on the believers to earnestly contend for the faith. So uh, just very quickly, let me explain to you what we're going to be trying to do in the nights that are ahead. When the Lord Jesus wanted to raise Lazarus from the dead, it was his power that would raise that man. But he told the people who were there, you roll away the stone. He could very easily have removed the stone without using them at all, but he told them, you roll away the stone, and when the stone was rolled away, it wasn't rolled away to somehow empower the Lord Jesus to do what he was going to do. It was rolled away to allow Lazarus to come out. They rolled the stone away. He raised Lazarus from the dead. So all we're going to be trying to do in uh, the nights that we have before us is just try to remove some stones that may be in the way of people because it's God who saves. Nobody gets saved because you convince them that the Bible is true, but no one becomes saved who doesn't believe the Bible is true. So that is what we'll be trying to do. And tonight's topic is, is God there? Let me just give you a quote from somebody who uh, put it very succinctly. Inside your head is a three-pound lump of jelly cauliflower that arguably represents the crowning achievement of God's creative genius. It contains billions of neurons, each as complex as a miniature computer. These neurons are interlinked in as many as a quadrillion synapses that work from the moment that the mind is develops in the womb until the day that God takes us to heaven 
or somebody has said it works from the moment that the mind is developed in the womb until the day that you get up to speak in public. However, the idea that we can determine whether there is a God from what he has done is a very important thing to consider. You see, it used to be years ago, and if you've ever heard the expression, the God of the gaps, it used to be years ago that God was sort of the answer. He was filled in where we had gaps, where we couldn't explain something. Just as the ancient um, pagans, if they heard thunder, they thought it was Thor with his hammer. They were explaining what they couldn't explain. They were attributing to their gods. And so people imagine that Christians were doing the same thing. What we couldn't understand in nature, what we couldn't understand around us, we just uh, attributed it to God. But then what happened is, as science began to advance, and we began to understand why things were happening, why did thunder, why did lightning, why did this and this happen, when, when we got the answers to those, we no longer needed God. Until people have began to imagine, we really don't need God at all for anything. We can understand everything. Now, there has been a complete reversal of that, because now... What we have learned shows us how little we did know. Because you see, when Darwin wrote his um, terrible book, which is filled with racism and ethnic cleansing, when Darwin wrote his book, he imagined, for instance, that the human cell was a very, very simple thing. Now we know through science that the human cell is 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 one of the most complex things in the universe, that it's like a like a, a miniature factory. We understand that every cell in your body is stored with a library of information. Who put the information there? Who, who, who is it, who is it that, that, that stored us with that information, if not God himself? Very, very difficult for us, very difficult for us to think about nothing. If I challenge you to think nothing, what would come to your mind? Because whenever people talk about the the beginning and why things are here, they always start with something. Julie Andrews had it right. Nothing comes from nothing. Nothing ever could. And when you try to think about nothing, that's very hard. But it had to come from somewhere. And all I'm going to do just uh, this this I've got four pages here. And I'm not going to bore you with. Um, I just I just I just want to tell you something about one part of your makeup the human ear. Somebody has written, the human ear is intricate beyond imagination. The organ of corti alone, a spiraling three millimeter diameter ridge of cells in the inner ear that seems to play a crucial part in the way we hear pitch and direction of sound, contains some 20,000 rods and more than 30,000 nerve endings. How could the ear function at all if the separate parts had to come together through millions of years of supposed evolution. Here is what a doctor wrote. Ordinary conversation causes air molecules to vibrate and move the eardrum a mere 10,000th of a centimeter, but with enough precision to differentiate all the sounds of human speech. The eardrum membrane has the flexibility to register the drop of a pin, as well as the noise of a metropolitan subway 100 million, pardon me, trillion times louder. It could hardly be more sensitive. If your sensitivity increased by a tiny amount, we would hear the movement of air molecules as a constant whooshing sound. That is an affliction that some people have. Survivors of high school biology should know what happens after the eardrum vibrates. Three tiny bones, informally known as the hammer, anvil, and stirrup, transfer that vibration into the middle ear. This doctor said, I have worked with most of the bones in the human body, and none are more remarkable than these three, the body's smallest. Unlike every other bone, these three do not grow with age. A one-day-old infant has those three bones fully developed. They are in constant, unrelieved motion, since every sound that reaches us causes those bones to swing into action. Working together, they magnify the forces that vibrate the eardrum until it is 20 times greater than when it entered. 
One doctor ended, just listen to the significant word he used. One doctor speaking about the ear said, those signals then land in a part of the brain where the signal is received and interpreted so that we understand what we're hearing because it has been instantaneously translated by our brains. Why is the way we hear so complicated? Don't ask me, he said. I didn't design it. <laughs> I didn't design it. But I count myself lucky every day that I can hear. Do you hear the word he used? I didn't design it. Because when you see something that is complex, you realize that the design demands a designer. When you see information, as we'll note perhaps on another night, if you, if you see the simplest of information, the simplest of messages, if you're walking down a beach and you see what looks like supposed heart shape and you see that uh, Gregory loves Eustacia, you would never in a million years think that the waves came up on the beach and made that little symbol and made those words. You would understand that if that information is there, somebody put that information there. Somebody put a volume, a library of information inside you. Who did that? Who designed the human body? Who designed our world? I hope by the time this meeting, or at least this series is done, you realize that God is there. God is there. And he is powerful. And he is your God. In some ways, I think I've given you my outline for tonight, because I want you to notice that since God is the creator, then we can insist that life has meaning, that life is not an accident, that life is not the result of blind chance. Because you see, living as though there is no God robs human life of its dignity, of its sanctity, of its preeminence. Just think about the babies that are killed. Millions upon millions of babies killed via abortion. Think about the trend toward euthanasia, so that whether you're thinking of getting rid of life at the beginning because it's inconvenient, or at the end for the same reason, life seems to be very, very cheap. History condemns the 20th century as one of the bloodiest in recorded history. And much of that bloodshed was due to atheistic regimes carrying Darwinism and evolution to its logical conclusion. Do not misunderstand me. I am not saying that every atheist is a violent person. I am saying that when you take the idea of evolution and carry it to its inevitable conclusion, you realize that life means nothing. Let me give you a quote from Edward Simon, professor of biology at Purdue University. He is an evolutionist. He's not a Christian. He is an evolutionist. This is what he said. I don't claim that Darwin and his theory of evolution brought on the Holocaust, but I cannot deny that the theory of evolution and the atheism it engendered led to the moral climate that made a Holocaust possible. Think about the millions of people who were killed in the great proletariat cultural revolution of China. Mao Zedong, all told, was responsible for the murder of 72 million human beings. Joseph Stalin is responsible, as far as we can count, for the death of 40 million. Hitler, not counting the war that he started, is responsible for the death of 15 million. Paul Pot is a small evil figure on history. He only killed 2 million people. What did they all have in common? They didn't believe there was a God. And therefore, life is cheap. Life is nothing. It's an accident, says evolution. We're just here. Somebody said, if it happened again, it may not, never actually occur. Life might never happen. Just, just a fluke of nature that here we are. So when you take God out of the equation, suddenly life has lost its dignity, its sanctity, its preeminence. But it also has lost its purpose. As the only creatures in this world, you, the only creature in this world with the capacity to understand in some measure God, to communicate and interact with that God, 
to learn something of the greatness of that God and therefore to love that God. You, as a result of sin, you have been relegated to living at a different level, never reaching higher than those around us, all just a, just a horizontal relationship and having no relationship with the God that made us. That's what sin has done to us. So no wonder the suicide rate among young people, staggering rate of people who are feeling, what's the point of living? Because life has lost its purpose. No wonder people seek for some some way to dull the emptiness of life with drugs or alcohol, just to escape that sense that there's, there's nothing here that's really worthwhile. You see, uh, you, you could buy, let's pick a brand. You could buy a Lexus, drive it home, pull it around the back of your head, pop the trunk, open all four doors, get a shovel, Put a few inches of soil into the back trunk, plant some seeds, hang some flower pots on the doors, throw some dirt into the floors, plant some more flowers in there, and the car might function quite well in holding those flowers up and growing flowers in an open trunk with the sun and the rain. But that's not what the car was made for. That's not that's not what the car. That, that car is made for the highway. That car is made for transportation and comfort. That car could do so much more than that. You were not made. Please listen to me. You were not made to try to find some sort of happiness in a world that can't give it to you and just kind of make your way from, from you know Monday to Friday in the hopes that the weekend will give you something to just enjoy until it's back into the daily grind. grind. You were made for God. You were made for heaven. You were made for eternity. And sin has ruined all of that as far as you are concerned. But we can see that since God is the creator, Life has meaning. Life has not only a dignity, a sanctity, a preeminence to it, but a purpose to it. And I should tell you as well that sin has robbed us of a prospect, of a future, of something to look forward to. You see, failing to grasp that we have come from God, we don't realize that we're traveling to God. That one day every one of us has to meet this being called God. That we must meet God. That, that is an inescapable thing. I have heard of people who wanted to escape something that was coming. Some embarrassing disclosure, some, some financial ruin, whatever it was, to escape what was coming, they simply ended their life. And so as a result of that, they didn't have to face what was coming. How do you avoid meeting God? Because even if you take your life, what you do is you just send yourself out to, to God's world, to eternity. We have to meet God. We're accountable to that God. And I want to posit for you that the greatest ambition in your life ought to be to get ready, to get ready for the meeting that you have with God. Because without God, life becomes hopeless, as well as purposeless and meaningless. But since he is a faithful creator, we can infer that life has obviously been marred. Something has gone wrong. Because everywhere we look, we are reminded of God's unchanging care for us his forethought and wisdom in constructing a world that is suited to human life. These facts make us search for an answer to the planetary and personal problems that have plagued our world and our life. You look around you. What a world we live in. Stored with everything we need. When you see what conditions are like on other planets, when you see what it's like out there in, in space, what did the astronauts call it, the the blue planet. They looked back from the bleakness of, of the moon, and, and there was, of course, the black background of, the, of, the, of space, and then there was this small little blue pill, this small little blue thing in the sky 
and everything they knew and everything they loved and everybody they knew was all in that little thing. What a world God. He never, he never, he never had to issue, did he? He never had to issue a correction. He never had to say, well, no, I got that wrong. I need, I need to fix that. If you work with computers, you know how many times you are doing upgrades and, and something is being corrected. Somebody found a flaw. It has to be corrected. God made a world. In fact, just think of this. Almost everything, almost everything we know is lighter, lighter in its gaseous state and becomes heavier in its solid state. Except for one thing. When water freezes, it floats instead of sinks. If that were not the one exception, the lands would be flooded. Ice would sink. Waters would overflow. And the, the lands would be flooded. But just this one distinction. And in a thousand, thousand ways, somebody has said the sweet, the numbers all had to be dialed to the sweet spot. And in, 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 it wasn't a thousand. It was, was hundreds of thousands upon thousands of things had to be precisely so. For life to exist. So if God made a world like that, and, and yet we live in a world that is hazardous and perilous and dangerous, something has gone wrong. What is it? This book has the answer. This book tells us the problem in our world is the problem that's in here, that we are sinners. You see, sin deceived Adam and Eve into thinking that they could live without God. Is that what you're doing tonight? Is that what you're doing tonight? Trying to live as if there were no God. That's what the prodigal wanted to do, didn't he? He wanted to live as if his father didn't, ex didn't exist. He said, give me the portion of goods that will come to me when you're dead. I want to live as if you don't exist. How'd that work out? Young man going into a far off country trying to put as much distance as he could between his father and himself and then finding how empty and dangerous the world was. We have tried myriad substitutes for make up to make up for the sense of loss that we feel. But nothing, absolutely nothing has filled what, what the French mathematician and philosopher Blaise Pascal called the God-shaped vacuum in our hearts. The God-shaped vacuum. When my children were younger, there was this annoying game that they had. What made it annoying was the constant tick, 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 tick of the timer. It was just a square thing with two levels, and the top level had cutouts of different, different um, shapes. There were triangles, there were squares, there were ovals, and then there were these plastic pieces that had just a little thing that you could grab to hold on to, and the, the, the game was to teach children shapes, they'd have to find the square, and the square would only fit into the square hole, and the oval would only fit into the oval, and the triangle would only go into the triangle. You couldn't take the triangle and push it into the square. And of course, what happens is this, this, this clock is ticking away, and they're trying to get it in, and then if it comes to zero, the whole thing pops and all the pieces go flying, and the tick, 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 tick starts all over again when they try to get all the pieces in. The, you, you, can't, you can't take this and make it fit where it doesn't go. There's an emptiness in your heart created by sin because you have been cut off from God. You cannot take earthly relationships and use them to fill that emptiness. You can't take drink and drugs. You can't take immorality and sin. You can't take fun and enjoyment and somehow make up for that God-shaped emptiness that's in your heart. You were made for God. Sin has robbed you of that. If you ever get to Simi Valley in California and you go through the, the fascinatingly interesting presidential library of the late the former president, Ronald Reagan, there's a point when you come around to another display and in large letters on the, the wall are the words of Joseph Stalin. This is what he said. Ideas, ideas are more powerful than guns. We would not let our enemies have guns. Why should we let them have ideas? 
Got that? Ideas are more powerful than guns. We would not let our enemies have guns. Why should we let them have ideas? Because he understood, you let an idea get into the mind of a person, an idea that maybe they should be free. Maybe they should have freedom of speech. Maybe they should have freedom of religion. Ideas are more powerful than guns. But listen to me, bad ideas are just as powerful. See, bad ideas. And a bad idea is what got into the mind of Adam and Eve. We don't need God. And as a result of that, trying to live without God, they were marred, and their world was marred. Sin destroyed the paradise that God intended for you to enjoy. It destroyed it. The Garden of Eden was a place providing Adam and Eve, and, and therefore, by extension, all of us, with everything needed for joyous, beneficial, satisfying living. Physical needs? All around them was a garden. The enjoyable employment that they had all there, an environment suited to their well-being. Spiritual and mental needs, God visited them. They were learning from the great creator. They were interacting with this greatest of all beings, God. Spiritual needs met by God. Emotional and, and in some senses, the, the need of our souls with one another. And then sin came in. And all of a sudden, a world that was very good, a world that was a paradise, was ruined by sin. Sin entered into the heart of Adam and Eve. And not only did nature change, but their nature changed. And they became sinners. It introduced friction, unrest, chaos, unfairness, and it annihilated paradise that God intended for us, all because they bought into the awful lie, we don't need God. Let me give you the words. Perhaps since this is being broadcast, I should not have mentioned the name earlier, so I'll leave this man's name out, but he is, or was, a professor of philosophy at New York University. Please listen carefully to his words. I want atheism to be true. And I am made uneasy by the fact that some of the most intelligent and well-informed people I know are religious believers. It isn't just that I don't believe in God and naturally hope there is no God. I don't want there to be a God. I don't want the universe to be like that. Now, that is the statement of a scientist, of an educated man. Does that sound like a search for truth? Does that sound like an unbiased search for, for real truth? I don't want there to be a God. I don't want the universe to be like that. Does that sound like an unbiased search for truth or a prejudiced mind unwilling to accept the awful possibility that there might be a God. What, what, what causes a person to think that way? Sin. In fact, the Christian writer Paul Mosier, he said that one atheist friend of his said that if he ever had to admit that there was a God, he'd kill himself. He'd kill himself. In other words, there is an enmity that sin created in our heart. It doomed us to pointless existence now and a hopeless future in eternity. And had God left us that way, we would have perished forever. But I do want to tell you that since God is a loving creator, we can ensure that life can be mended. You know, there's a wonderful word that's used in the Old Testament. Um, the word in our English Bible, at least in the Bible that I generally read from, the woman says that God devises means so that those who are banished will not be expelled from him. The actual meaning of that word devised is that God weaves, God wove, God, God manufactured a way for you to be brought back to him, for you to be saved from your sin. Let me tell you that, first of all, it involves someone. It involves a redeemer the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Because no sooner did sin enter in the Garden of Eden than God promised that a deliverer would come who would destroy the enemy who had created this problem and had tempted man into sin, that he would come, he himself would be wounded, but he would destroy the enemy and provide a way of salvation. Do you know what that would involve for him? It would involve suffering. Suffering. God said that, that when this deliverer came, he would be wounded. And how the Lord Jesus suffered. Do you, do you know... Do you know the reason why the Savior suffered? The Bible tells us he suffered for sins. Not his own, because he had none. He suffered for sins, the just one for the unjust. The Bible tells us Christ died for our sins. If you've ever watched any movie uh, about the life of Christ, here, here, here is the problem with that. When they get to the part about Calvary, all they can show you is the physical sufferings. Well, all that they can depict for you is what human beings did to the Lord Jesus. I, I've never seen them, but I, uh, I, I've read about it and I've seen pictures of it. They, 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 can, dis, they can display, they can depict brutality and violence and, and the disfiguring of the Lord Jesus. What they cannot depict for you is that on that cross, Christ was suffering for my sins. Christ was being punished by God for my sins, that he suffered for sins. Do you know the sacrifice it involved? The Bible says that he died for my sins. He didn't merely suffer for them, as terrible as that was, but he would have to make the ultimate payment. He would have to die for my sins. On one occasion, he told a parable about a man who had a hundred sheep and one was lost. And he said that the shepherd will go after the sheep until he find it. And in those significant words, until he find it. The Lord Jesus is telling us how far he would go in order to save you. He would give everything. He would suffer everything. He would sacrifice everything in order to save you. And the wonder is that he accomplished that work. He rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and he is alive today able to save anyone who trusts him. There is a man, I think he has died, but there were two occasions in the year, Easter and Christmas, when he would produce, his name was Johnny Hart, he would produce a strip in the comics part of a thing that used to, people used to get. It was called a newspaper. And uh, his strip was called B.C. But at Easter and Christmas, he used his flair for poetry, and he would come off with a special column. Let me give you one of them. It seems to me that since the fall, that is, since sin came into the world, it seems to me that since the fall, without even thinking it odd, man has had no trouble at all believing that he can be God. How he would do this, I cannot conceive, though he certainly thinks he can, and yet he can't bring himself to believe that God can become a man. And that's exactly what happened. And the season that just passed us with its constant crash scenes and, and Bethlehem scenes reminds us the great creator against whom you and I have sinned was here, became one of us. God cannot die. God became a man so that he could die. And as the redeemer, he gave his life, he shed his blood, he sacrificed himself to provide salvation for you. Now I can tell you tonight, that as a result of that, there is a remedy. It's called the gospel. And Paul, in Romans chapter 1, where we read, now remember, the Romans, their legionnaires had gone throughout the, the known world up to that point. When Paul was writing up to that point, they were, with only one or two exceptions, they were undefeated. He writes to them about God's power. 
And he said, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also because the gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. So just follow me with this, please. I am sure. Different spots here on the wall, in the back. There are electrical outlets. You plug into that outlet, and the power is going to cause whatever you have plugged in to operate. You could be holding something in your hand, a fan, you have a portable fan, and it's not working because it hasn't been connected to the thing that will make it work. The power is there. You just haven't tapped into it. Now listen to what Paul says. The gospel of Christ is the power of God. You know how powerful it is? Do you know how powerful it is? It has saved drunkards. It has saved alcoholics. It has saved drug addicts. It has saved immoral people. It has saved religious people. It has saved atheists. It has saved agnostics. It has saved people from other religions. It has saved billions upon billions upon billions of people. It will save you because it's God's power to everyone that believes. There's that connection. Let me try to just illustrate that from the Bible in a better way than the electrical outlet. There's a man named Jeremiah, and he was thrown into a huge hole in the ground, a pit. And he's sinking down there. There's no, there's no bread, there's no water. There's just mud, and he's sinking at the bottom of that pit. He's an old man. He's going to die. And up in the palace, there's a man moved with compassion. And he goes to the king, and he says, Jeremiah will die. And the king sends him on a mission of mercy to rescue Jeremiah and he brings old rags and he brings ropes he throws the old rags down and he says here put these under your arm and then he lowers a rope to him there's 30 men along with this other end so 31 men are at the top of this open pit and suddenly a rope comes down to Jeremiah now those men are going to be able to pull Jeremiah up out of the pit do you know what he has to do take the rope take the rope they pull the rope and he isn't holding on. It doesn't pull him out. So that rope is the power of deliverance for a person who takes it. I left a gospel meeting like this on July the 10th, 1966. The aisle was down the middle. I was on the left side of the hall, about three rows from the back. And just one truth, one awful, overwhelming, inundating truth had burst into my soul that night. And it was that I was lost and on the way to hell. And I stumbled home from that meeting. Went up to my room, got down on my knees, and I, I just told God, please, God, I don't want to go to hell. Would you show me how to be saved? I'm using an analogy here, don't, don't mistake me, but it's just as if God lowered a rope into my room right there that night and said, here, grab this. Do you know what the rope was? He that believes on the Son has everlasting life. And I was stunned. Do you know why? Because up to that moment in my life, I thought of salvation as a joint effort between Jesus and me. That he had done so much for me at Calvary. And that he had only left me this little bit to do. And if I would just do this, I would be saved. And I kept working away on that little bit that I was supposed to do. Trying to do it. Trying to come. Trying to receive. Trying to believe. Trying to accept him. And all of a sudden, I saw in that verse, salvation is Christ. Not, not Christ in me. Salvation is Christ. I just took him. It's like grabbing the rope. Do you know what happened? Well, when Jeremiah grabbed the rope, all the power that was up here operated, kicked into action, and pulled him up out of the pit. And the moment that I took God at his word, all the power of his gospel pulled me off the broad road, placed me on the narrow way, urged my sins, saved my soul, 
all because Christ died for my sins according to the scriptures. So if there's somebody here tonight and you're wondering why life seems empty, why life seems purposeless, please understand. There's a Savior who can make you right with God and bring you back to him. I have some minutes left, so I'm just going to take a couple of your value, uh, minutes of your valuable time because if this is what we're talking about, I want to tell you about the salvation of a scientist. Again, I'll leave his name out. He was a senior scientist at Marshall Space Flight Center, um, a NASA scientist, and he said, quote, to be honest, the little I knew about Christianity bothered me. In particular, Christians in my area who went from house to house inviting people to events at their churches irritated me. I also had a fundamental problem with the Bible. Wasn't its first book, Genesis, merely a mythical account of how the universe and life came into being? Eventually, I began to realize, to my surprise, that there was a group of scientists who believed that the universe and all life within it had been created by some greater being, not by mere chance. They were seemingly able to do so by using scientific arguments, not just religious dogma. I began to study their case, and after some months of analysis, I finally became convinced that the theory of creation actually had a much better scientific basis than the theory of evolution. For the creation model, as he said, was actually better able to explain the physical and biological complexity in the world. The possibility then presented itself that despite all I had previously thought, Genesis might actually be true. That realization led me to open the Bible for the first time and to read it for myself. I was struck by the unity of the Bible, the way it agreed with itself, even though it was written by 40 different authors over a period of 1,600 years. At last, I had to face the reality, based on all the evidence, that the basic tenets of Christianity were true and that the gospel of Christ really changes people's lives. True, my decision to become a Christian involved faith, but not the kind of faith caricatured by the likes of atheist Richard Dawkins, a faith that just believes in the teeth of real evidence to the contrary. My faith in Christ was evidence-based. I had very well-founded reasons for believing in him. In fact, John explains why he recorded what he saw, that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. So having examined the biblical record of creation and the person and work of Christ on the cross for my sins, of which I knew I was guilty, I put my trust in Christ for salvation. I hope tonight that's what you will do, that you will put your trust in Christ for the salvation of your soul. Shall we pray? Father, we thank thee for each one who has come tonight. We have been reminded of how inclement an evening it is, and we deeply appreciate the opportunity of meeting. Bless thy word to each one. We Pray similarly for safety as we leave. We give our thanks for thy beloved son, that the son of God loved us and that he gave himself for us. Take us home in safety, we pray, giving thanks in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.